Hatchet by Gary Paulson Read aloud by Ms. Love Chapter 7 Mother! He screamed it, and he could not be sure if the scream awakened him or the pain in his stomach. His whole abdomen was torn with great rolling jolts of pain, pain that doubled him in the darkness of the little shelter, put him over and face down in the sand to moan again and again, mother, 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 never anything like this, never. It was as if all the berries, all the pits had exploded in the center of him, ripped and tore at him. He crawled out the doorway and was sick in the sand, then crawled still farther and was sick again, vomiting with terrible and with terrible diarrhea for over an hour. For over a year, he thought, until he was at last empty and drained of all strength. Then he crawled back into the shelter and fell again to the sand, but could not sleep at first, could do nothing except lie there, and his mind decided then to bring the memory up again. In the mall, every detail, his mother sitting in the station wagon with the man, and she had leaned across and kissed him, kissed the man with the short blonde hair, and it was not a friendly peck, but a kiss, a kiss where she turned her head over at an angle and put her mouth against the mouth of the blonde man who was not his father and kissed mouth to mouth and then brought her hand up to touch his cheek, his forehead while they were kissing. And Brian saw it, saw this thing that his mother did with the blonde man, saw the kiss that became the secret that his father still did not know about, know all about. The memory was so real that he could feel the heat in the mall that day, could remember the worry that Terry would turn and see his mother, could remember the worry of the shame of it, and then the memory faded, and he slept again. Awake. For a second, perhaps two, he did not know where he was, was still in his sleep somewhere. Then he saw the sun streaming in the open doorway of the shelter, and heard the close, vicious whine of the mosquitoes, and knew. He brushed his face, completely welted now with two days of bites, completely covered with lumps and bites, and was surprised to find the swelling on his forehead had gone down a great deal, was almost gone. Oh, the smell was awful, and he couldn't place it. Then he saw the pile of berries at the back of the shelter and remembered the night and being sick. Oh, too many of them, he said aloud. Too many gut cherries. He crawled out of the shelter and found where he'd messed the sand. He used sticks and cleaned it as best he could, covered it with clean sand, and went down to the lake to wash his hands and get a drink. It was still very early only just past true dawn, and the water was so calm he could see his reflection. It frightened him. The face was cut and bleeding, swollen and lumpy, the hair all matted, and on his forehead a cut had healed but had left the hair stuck with blood and scab. His eyes were slits in the bites, and he was somehow covered with dirt. He slapped the water with his hand to destroy the mirror. Ugly, he thought. Very, very ugly. And he was, at that moment, almost overcome with self-pity. He was dirty and starving and bitten and hurt and lonely and ugly and afraid and so completely miserable that it was like being in a pit, a dark, deep pit with no way out. He sat back on the bank and fought, crying. Then he let it come and cried for perhaps three, four minutes. Long tears, self-pity tears, wasted tears. He stood, went back to the water, and took small drinks. As soon as the cold water hit his stomach, 
Oh, he felt the hunger sharpen as it had before, and he stood and held his abdomen until the hunger cramps receded. He had to eat. He was weak with it again, down with the hunger, and he had to eat. Back at the shelter, the berries lay in a pile where he had dumped them when he grabbed his windbreaker. Gut cherries, he called them in his mind now, and he thought of eating some of them. Not such a crazy amount as he had, which he felt brought on the sickness in the night, but just enough to stave off the hunger a bit. He crawled into the shelter. Some flies were on the berries, and he brushed them off. He selected only the berries that were solidly ripe, not the light red ones, but the berries that were dark maroon, red to black, and swollen in ripeness. When he had a small handful of them, he went back down to the lake and washed them in the water. Small fish scattered away when he splashed the water up, and he wished he had a fishing line and hook. Then he ate them carefully, spitting out the pits. They were still tart, but had a sweetness to them, although they seemed to make his lips a bit numb. When he finished, he was still hungry, but the edge was gone, and his legs didn't feel as weak as they had. He went back to the shelter. It took him half an hour to go through the rest of the berries and sort them, putting all the fully ripe ones in a pile on some leaves, the rest in another pile. When he was done, he covered the two piles with grass he tore from the lake shore to keep the flies off and went back outside. They were awful berries, those gut cherries, he thought. But there was food there, food of some kind, and he could eat a bit more later tonight if he had to. For now, he had a full day ahead of him. He looked at the sky through the trees and saw that while there were clouds, they were scattered and did not seem to hold rain. There was a light breeze that seemed to keep the mosquitoes down, and he thought, looking up along the lake shore, if there was one kind of berry, there should be other kinds, sweeter kinds. If he kept the lake in sight as he had done yesterday, he should be all right, should be able to find home again, and it stopped him. He had actually thought it that time. Home. Three days. No, two. Or was it three? Yes, this was the third day, and he had thought of the shelter as home. He turned and looked at it, studied the crude work. The brush made a fair wall, not weather tight, but it cut most of the wind off, he hadn't done so badly at that. Maybe it wasn't much, but also maybe it was all he had for a home. All right, he thought, so I'll call it home. He turned back and set off up the side of the lake, heading for the gut cherry bushes, his windbreaker bag in his hand. Things were bad, he thought, but maybe not that bad. Maybe he could find some better berries. When he came to the gut cherry bushes, he paused. The branches were empty of birds, but still had many berries, and some of those that had been merely red yesterday were now a dark maroon to black, much riper. Maybe he should stay and pick them to save them. But the explosion in the night was still much in his memory, and he decided to go on. Gut cherries were food, but tricky to eat. He needed something better. Another hundred yards up the shore, there was a place where the wind had torn another path. These must have been fierce winds, he thought, to tear places up like this, as they had the path he had found with the plane when he crashed. Here the trees were not all the way down, but twisted and snapped off halfway up from the ground, so their tops were all down and rotted and gone, leaving the snags poking into the sky like broken teeth. It made for tons of dead and dry wood, and he wished once more he could get a fire going. It also made a kind of clearing. With the tops of the trees gone, the sun could get down to the ground, and it was filled with small, thorny bushes that were covered with berries. <gasps> raspberries! <gasps> These he knew because there were some raspberry bushes in the park, and he and Terry were always picking and eating them when they biked there. The berries were full and ripe, and he tasted one to find it sweet and with none of the problems of the gut cherries. 
Although they'd not grow in clusters, there were many of them, and they were easy to pick, and Brian smiled and started eating. Oh, sweet, juicy, he thought. Oh, they were sweet with just a tiny tang, and he picked and ate and picked and ate and thought that he had never tasted anything this good. Soon, as before, his stomach was full, but now he had some sense, and he did not gorge or cram more down. Instead, he picked more and put them in his windbreaker, feeling the morning sun on his back and thinking that he was rich, rich with food now, just rich, and he heard a noise to his rear, a slight noise, and he turned and saw the bear. He could do nothing, think nothing. His tongue, stained with berry juice, stuck to the roof of his mouth, and he stared at the bear. It was black with a cinnamon-colored nose, not twenty feet from him, and big. No, huge. It was all black fur and huge. He had seen one in the zoo in the city once, a black bear, but it had been from India or somewhere. This one was wild and much bigger than the one in the zoo, and it was right there. Right there. The sun caught the ends of the hairs along his back. Shining black and silky, the bear stood on its hind legs, half up, and studied Brian. Just studied him. Then lowered itself and moved slowly to the left, eating berries as it rolled along, waffling and delicately using its mouth to lift each berry from the stem. And in seconds, it was gone gone, and Brian still had not moved. His tongue was stuck to the top of his mouth, the tip half out. His eyes were wide, and his hands were reaching for a berry. Then he made a sound, a low, mm. it made no sense, it was just a sound of fear, of disbelief that something that large could have come so close to him without his knowing. It just walked up to him and could have eaten him, and he could have done nothing, nothing. And when the sound was half done, a thing happened with his legs, a thing he had nothing to do with, and they were running in the opposite direction from the bear, back toward the shelter. He would have run all the way in panic, but after he had gone perhaps fifty yards, his brain took over and slowed and finally stopped him. If the bear had wanted you, his brain said, he would have taken you. It is something to understand, he thought, not something to run away from. The bear was eating berries, not people. The bear made no move to hurt you, to threaten you. It stood to see you better, study you, then went on its way eating berries. It was a big bear, but it did not want you, did not want to cause you harm, and that is the thing to understand here. He turned and looked back at the stand of raspberries. The bear was gone. The birds were singing. He saw nothing that could hurt him. There was no danger here that he could sense, could feel. In the city at night, there was sometimes danger. You could not be in the park at night after dark because of the danger. But here, the bear had looked at him and had moved on, and... This filled his thoughts, and the berries were so good, so good, so sweet and rich, and his body was so empty. And the bear had almost indicated that it didn't mind sharing, had just walked from him, and the berries were so good. And he thought finally, if he did not go back and get the berries, he would have to eat those gut cherries again tonight. That convinced him, and he walked slowly back to the raspberry patch and continued picking for the entire morning, although with great caution. And once, when a squirrel rustled some pine needles at the base of a tree, he nearly jumped out of his skin. About noon, the sun was almost straight overhead. The clouds began to thicken and look dark. In moments, it started to rain, and he took what he had picked and trotted back to the shelter. He had eaten probably two pounds of raspberries and had maybe another three pounds in his jacket rolled in a pouch. 
He made it to the shelter just as the clouds completely opened and the rain roared down in sheets. Soon the sand outside was drenched and there were rivulets running down to the lake. But inside he was dry and snug. He started to put the picked berries back in the sorted pile with the gut cherries, but noticed that the raspberries were seeping through the jacket. They were much softer than the gut cherries and apparently were being crushed a bit with their own weight. When he held the jacket up and looked beneath it, he saw a stream of red liquid. He put a finger in it and found it to be sweet and tangy, like pop without the fizz. And he grinned and lay back on the sand, holding the bag up over his face and letting the seepage drip into his mouth. Outside, the rain poured down, but Brian lay back, drinking the syrup from the berries, dry and with the pain almost gone, the stiffness also gone his belly full, and a good taste in his mouth. For the first time since the crash, he was not thinking of himself, of his own life. Brian was wondering if the bear was as surprised as he to find another being in the berries. Later in the afternoon, as evening came down, he went to the lake and washed the sticky berry juice from his face and hands, then went back to prepare for the night. While he had accepted and understood that the bear did not want to hurt him, it was still much in his thoughts, and as darkness came into the shelter, he took the hatchet out of his belt and put it by his head, his hand on the handle, as the day caught up with him, and he slept. <laughs>